Uh, we have Niraj Pandey. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. That's correct. Um, uh, he's a student at Ash Ashoka University and he's studying computer science. He's interested in generative arts, software development and quantitative finance. And he's going to talk about creating art with code. So how to use algorithms to create very nice looking things, I suppose. Well, this That's is going to be exciting. Correct. So <laughs> let, let's see what you have to present. By the way, where, where are you joining from? I'm joining from India. And where in India? Uh, New Delhi. Ah, right. Nice. Very nice. <laughs> How's the weather in, in New Delhi? What what time is it now? Uh, it's it's, pre it's pretty good. It's 2.30 uh, p.m. Ah, in the right. afternoon. Good. Well, <laughs> comfortable time, right. Excellent. So let's start the screen sharing and then you can go ahead and give the right. talk. Right. Shall I start the screen? Yes, please. Okay. So the talk is The Joy of Creating Art with Code and I'm Neeraj. Hi, everyone. And a little bit about myself. I'm currently a sophomore student at Ashoka University, and my interest lies in software development, generative art, distributed computing, and quantitative finance. So these are the points for discussion of the talk. So we'll be talking about generative art, the history behind generative art. We'll see a quick overthrow of how processing.py mode works. And <clears throat> then we'll see how we can use geometry, algorithms, and randomness that frames our generative art. And we'll be seeing some quick examples using processing.py. So the main objective or the main goal of this talk is to look at Python as an artistic tool uh, with the simplicity of generative art using processing and PyChiral. So what is a generative art? So an art created through the use of an autonomous system is simply generative art. That's like the simplest definition you will see. So it uses iterative commands to draw vector-based shapes on the screen. And most of the art created draws inspiration from modern art and especially the pop art. And usually an autonomous system is required because without it, it will mostly be a digital art and randomness can be one form of that autonomous system. So before we go forward, so let's see how all this came from. So when you talk about the analog art, which is the art which is manipulated by hand, the complexity and scale requires exponentially more effort and time. And when you talk about computers, they excel at repeating processes for like endlessly without exhaustion. As you will see, uh, the ease at which, which we computers can create these art forms contributes uh, greatly to the aesthetic of generative art. Uh, in the past, one major uh, challenge which was faced by the early generative artists was the limitation of an output device. So the primary source of that time was using a plotter, which is a mechanical device holding a pen whose movements were controlled by the instructions that were programmed into the computer. And one of the first uh, artists to produce a plotter <coughs> color drawing uh, was Frieden Nick and the painting, the art has been shown on the screen. It's called Homage. And this is one of the earliest best known pieces of generative art. It's called Schotter by George Nies. And Schotter starts with the standard 12 by 12 rows and it increases in magnitude as we uh, go like down the row and it changes the rotation, the magnitude of location change. So generative art is uh, one of the best option when you're working on similar art pieces because um, maybe you want to create a similar art piece using your hand on a pen and paper and it might take you hours to produce one. So instead you can just input some simple commands from the computer and you can create thousands of such art pieces in a couple of minutes. So after the uh, creation of processing, it became much, much easier for artists and creators to design and uh, make computer art. So it was created by Ben Fry and Casey Rees, who worked on the processing foundation from the last like 19, 20 years now. And processing is a programming language and environment built with uh, media art communities, you can say. It's created to teach individuals uh, the intro of programming within the media arts context and serve as a software sketchbook. And okay, so the examples we'll be seeing in this talk will be using Python mode and processing mostly. So it's a good practice to quickly get an overview of how processing mode actually works with Python. So this is exactly how our any function will look like in 
processing in Python mode in processing. So we have two major functions. One is a setup and the other is a draw. And the setup function is basically, it runs once the program is executed and mostly the methods which are called inside the setup uh, function are the creating the size of the canvas, adding a background color, and maybe adding noise, adding some blur effects, etc. And the draw function runs until the program is stopped. So which means it is running in loops. So each statement is executed in sequence. Uh, as you can see, uh, if you don't want the draw function to run again and again, you can simply use no loop. And otherwise, uh, after the last line is executed, the first line will be executed back again. And if you run this program, you'll simply get a black canvas with a small ellipse or a circle on the screen or the canvas. So most of the art pieces are using mathematical functions like noise, trigonometry, uh, filter methods like blur, and we use various algorithms such as L systems, pixel sorting, disk, uh, poison disk sampling, etc. So we'll be discussing a few in this uh, slides and see how we can incorporate all these mathematical functions and algorithms and create some simple aesthetic art pieces. Okay, so we have the random function, which is like one of the most important functions which art is used pretty often. So the use, is, use case is pretty simple. It just provides you with a random floating point number between zero and one. And random function differs in different programming languages. So it's not like going to be the same how we are going to be using in processing. So in processing, random function is used by directly calling random and it returns a random floating point between zero and one. And if you want a random number between a range, it will be, uh, you have to provide a min and max range. And if you're not using processing, if you're using some other environment like PyCairo, you can simply use the random module which is available in Python. Okay, so before we move forward and start exploring art pieces that uses vector operations, shapes, and other method, we should understand how exactly an artist canvas looks like when you're working on a generative art. So, okay, so the canvas is like a 2D Cartesian plane where each point can be considered as a vector, uh, which is a vector in a 2D Cartesian plane that's basically the distance between two points. So as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, we have our Cartesian plane and each point can, uh, is denoted by X comma Y, which basically stores the information on how to get to that point from the previous point or here we're using origin. And we can further use operations or linear, linear algebra operations like linear transformation, rotation, to add some instructions to the vectors. And creating a point and a line is again pretty uh, straightforward. So if you want to go through all these again, so you can directly go to the processing official documentation and all these stuff is already being mentioned there. So I'll just quickly go through it. So a point can be created by passing uh, an XY coordinate and the processing will add a point to that pixel position in the canvas. And if you want a line, you can simply add the, the coordinates of those two points, x1, comma y1, x2, comma y2, and, we'll, and the processing will add a line between two points. And if you want to change the thickness, you can use stroke weight. And if you want to change the color, you can add the color by using stroke. And similarly, if you're working uh, with uh, PyCairo, you can use set line width, which is uh, an, substitute of uh, stroke weight. And similarly, you can create a line by using line two and other functions. And these are the very basic examples of how you can use those straight lines and uh, points on a canvas to create some very simple art pieces. So like on the left hand side, uh, there are vertical lines of different length and opacity and they're using some points of uh, random points with various variable uh, opacity. And on the right hand side, we have uh, just lines, but they are using a large set of colors palettes and are randomly using those to fill the stroke fill. And the next is, okay. So this is a very important function and we use it pretty often. Uh, it's called curve vertex and bezier curves. Uh, so curve vertex is an implementation of Catmull rom spline, which is a type of interpolating spline. Uh, that is, it basically goes through the points. In processing, uh, it specifies the vector coordinates for curves. So this function can be called in between, can only be called in between begin shape and end shape method so that it can create some sort of um, stroke uh, curves. 
And these functions allow creating complex forms on our Cartesian plane. And on the other hand, we have Bezier curve, which is a versatile mathematical uh, curve in vector graphics. Basically, these are the vector graphics that could be scaled indefinitely and has a series of anchor points and control points. So for Bezier curve, you need at least three uh, points uh, which is the initial point, the final point, and one control point or the anchor point. And you can simply call Bezier by providing the three point coordinates and it will create a Bezier curve on this canvas. And similarly, you can use curve two uh, to create a curve um, on the canvas if you're using Pi Cairo, which draws a curve from the point A to D and it has B and C as the anchor points. Right. So this is, a, uh, this is how curves of variable opacity and lens look like when we let the draw function run for a number of time and to implement this what we are doing here is we are basically um, inside the canvas we are creating a for loop from which is going from zero to three so zero to four so we are creating uh, four points here so we have x and y array initialized and on line 17 and 18 we are adding uh, the noise value so for now we I'm not going to tell you what exactly is nice. So for you can for now you can think of it as a random number generating function. Uh, so once we have those x and y values, we are in, uh, append, uh, like incrementing the m and n factors. And once we are done with the loop, we are creating a Bezier curve with all, all those four values, and we are increasing the offset values so that once uh, the draw function is done with one uh, loop. Uh, it should, the next uh, Bezier curve should not be formed on the same position. So there should be a distance in between. And when we let it run for some time, you get some like cool looking curves and all these things. Similarly, there is another inbuilt function in processing, which is curve vertex. And it's like, we need at least four points to create a simple curve on the screen. And you can call this function by simply calling curve vertex and providing the point coordinates, six and y. And here, what we're doing like on line 13, we are calling the curve vertex and we are going from top left of the canvas to the bottom right. And we are adding, we are, we are also using a line 15 no loop, which means we just want the draw function to execute once. And on line 13, we are using curve vertex, which is taking the i and j index of the loops and we are adding um, the random value between minus 10 and 10 to those um, i and j index. And, but if we would have run the program with a single curve vertex function, we would have got just a single point on the canvas, but we want some curves. So we added four, five, six, I think six more points. So when we run this program, we get the scribble type effects on the canvas. And if you let like add more points, it will make more like curves. And if you let the function run for more number of times by using frame count check, then it might cover the entire screen. And the next is, okay, so we can also create some basic shapes like ellipse, rectangles, and squares. And we'll, in the further videos, we'll see how we can implement them actually to create art pieces. So in ellipses can be created by providing four uh, parameters, with, uh, which is AB is stands for the X and Y coordinates, and C and D are basically the width and height. And a rectangle takes four required parameters, uh, which is A and B again, the XY coordinates, and C and D are the width and the height, and the other four uh, uh, variables are basically the border radius of the rectangle, and square takes X and Y coordinates and the side length of the square. Similarly, we can create the same shapes in PyCairo. Okay, so one best example is by creating some art, some art pieces which were already been created by artists. So this is an art piece called Composition 2 in red, blue, and yellow. It was created by Piet Mondrian. So this is not the actual painting. This is like created randomly with random fills and random shapes, but it looks similar. It's using just rectangles and stroke uh, colors. And on the right hand side, it's the same uh, paint, uh, a same sketch that we created on the left side, but instead of creating a single sketch on the canvas, we are adding uh, multiple sketches. And this is a one simple example where we can just use rectangles. This is very simple. and using just rectangles and some random color fill, we can create some cool looking uh, sketch. Uh, so to create this, what we're doing is like, we are going from top to bottom of the canvas 
And at each index, we are dividing the width of the canvas by a random midpoint. And then we are creating a rectangle from the initial position to that midpoint and from that midpoint to the final one. So once we are done creating the rectangles, we are filling them with a random color between zero and 255. So it can be a shade of black to gray, black to white, sorry. So once we run the function, we get something like uh, this on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, instead of using just random colors, we are also using uh, a color palette and then we're choosing colors from there. Right, and okay, linear interpolation. So the loop function or the linear interpolation function is very convenient for creating motion along a straight path uh, and for drawing uh, dotted lines. So it basically calculates the number between our two numbers at a specific increment or a specific increment of time. So the AMT or the amount parameter is the amount to interpolate between the two values. And we can say the zero value will be the first value, zero point will, will be the immediate next value and so on. So to understand the linear interpolation in a better way, we can think of something like a gradient fill in a canvas. So there isn't very uh, easy to use in build function in processing called lerp color. So what we're doing here is we are going from left to right of the canvas and we are uh, making adding a variable linear int value, which is basically mapping the value of index i uh, to zero and one, because we want the int value to be very small between zero and one, just like the noise value. And then we are using this linear int value to add a color fill. So we are uh, adding the, using the color fill as linear int color, which is basically using the lerp color function. And this lerp color function is taking the initial value of the color and the final color value. And it's um, adding the specific increment of uh, unit point that we created uh, above on line number 11. And once we have this color fill, we are just filling the rectangle we are creating. And once we let the function run, we get this uh, smooth, uh, smooth uh, gradient fill on the canvas. And OK, so for, by now, we talked a lot about how we can use random uh, numbers or random generated stuff to create these art pieces. So unlike random numbers generated that has no relationship between the previous number generated and the next number, uh, like we saw in the previous slides, uh, when we draw random points and the graph was pretty much like zigzag in a zigzag form. And here, instead of that, the graph lines are pretty much smooth. So in Perlin noise, the numbers generated are pretty much close to each other and has a relationship with each other and it's more organic in nature. And that's because these numbers generated are naturally ordered sequence of pseudo random numbers. So what it means is we can see here, okay, after this, uh, so implementing a noise, uh, like generating a noise number is pretty straightforward, like just like random, we just pass the XYZ coordinate, or if you're working on XY coordinate system, then just use noise and pass the coordinates value and it returns some Pauli noise at that value. And sometimes we want the noise value to be constant uh, whenever the draw function runs again and again. So we can just uh, fix the, uh, fix the noise value to a constant value by using noise seed. And similarly, if you're not using Python uh, processing, you can use the noise module in Python for PyCharo and other environments. Okay, we can see this example to understand noise in a better way. So what we're doing here is we are loading all the pixels from the image. And what we're doing is like, we're trying to add a variable, initialize a variable R, and we're trying using it to fill all those pixels back. So you're creating a variable R, uh, so basically we're looping from top left of the canvas and to the top uh, bottom right. So we're covering all the pixel values and at each index we are creating a variable R which is uh, generating a noise value at X offset and Y offset. And as noise value is between zero and one only, so which this value is pretty small. And to fill a color value, we want a color to be between zero and 255 uh, to maintain the RGB index. Uh, so we basically multiplying it by 255 so that we get a color shade between black and white and not just black. And once we have all these value, we are updating the pixel index with this color. And eventually we are updating all the pixels. And once we run this function, you get this cloud-like effect so basically this is just like small, small points, but as we are using noise values, all the uh, values, close, uh, pixel values are pretty much close to each other such so that the noise values are close to each other. 
And to understand this for like in a better way, we can say if you have a canvas and if you have two points on the canvas and those two points are pretty close to each other, then if we try to generate some random points on the, sorry, noise points on those two points, then the numbers will be pretty close to each other. And if we would have used random instead of noise, we would have got a canvas with just random points and this doesn't show any discernible pattern or so. Okay, just okay. right. Okay, so we can also use noise and some trigonometric functions like, like sine and cosine waves to create these uh, waves like structure with radion structures. And to implement this, we basically doing like we are making a while loop and it starts from zero to two pi. So we want our, our points to be aligned in a circular manner. So we are adding an X offset and a Y offset, which is basically mapping the cosine value and the sine value between zero and 10, because initially these values are between minus one and one. And once we have these offset values, we are creating a noise, a noise factor, which we'll be using to um, create our X and Y coordinates. So in the noise factor, what we are doing is like, we are basically mapping those X offset and the Y offset values. And we're also using a Z offset because we want the curves to go in other direction as well. So we are mapping those values between zero and 150. Uh, that's because we don't want our curves to be very small. So we want them to spread out across the uh, canvas. And once we have the noise factor, we are <clears throat> uh, changing the X and Y coordinates. And once we have changed those coordinate values and we are just creating curve vertex that we saw in the previous slides and we, as, and once we are done with this, we are decrementing the radius that we used in the noise factor, uh, uh, sorry, no, the X and Y coordinates. That's because we want that at each time the draw function is executing, we want the next uh, curves to be created at a distance different from the initial one. And we can also change uh, like, like, cool. So we can also change the RGB values or opacity uh, whatever you want to do. And you can also add other instructions. And if you run the program, you get something like this. So I'll just quickly go through the other slides because we are left with not much time. Okay, so Perlin noise. So it's like a very important function for adding movement to your art pieces. And you can also add some use noise functions to add grain like effect on this uh, canvas. And this is an example of how you can use Perlin noise fields. So these fields are basically the 2D fields of vectors, each pointing in a similar but different direction as its neighboring vectors. And the velocities uh, of these vectors depends on the other vectors only. So depending on how we draw these particles, uh, we can generate some pretty cool stuff. And as these um, are used for adding a movement in your art piece, you can see that we are creating a noise field where our particles are moving from the right hand side to the top left. And to implement this, it's we're just basically creating some random vector points on the canvas and just appending those vector points to the points object. And so once you have those points object inside the draw function, uh, we are uh, taking those, uh, the values of that object one by one and storing it inside vector object and we are looping from zero to 20. And what you're doing is uh, we are creating a noise value, which is like we are mapping the X and Y coordinates of that point uh, between zero and two pi, because we are getting the radiance value over here, because uh, by radiance value, we can change the X2 and Y2 parameters um, on line number 21 and 22. And so once we have created X1, Y1, X2, Y2 variables, we can add the vertex value at x1 comma y1 and we then have to update the vector object according to the x2 and y2 values that's because uh, once we have a point um, added to the canvas we want we want the next point to have a, a slightly different direction but as these are using noise values they will all be directing to a similar direction eventually and eventually if you let the program run for some time you will get something like this and we use heavy uh, use of geometrical patterns and fractals and chaotic, the like chaos theory when you're working in generative art. A very simple example of a ge geometrical pattern would be the Sierpinski triangle. So this is a very basic and one of the famous example of geometric pattern and where we are recursively dividing the triangle into smaller triangles and adding a stroke to it. 
And we can also modify the Sierpinski triangle by not just adding a stroke, we can also add some fill inside and we can use linear transformation that we talked about earlier. And we can use rotations, we can rotate these triangles, we can use curve vertex to shed the sides of it. And we can also use the recursive, recursive approach to create fractals and by using uh, vertex and curve vertex. And when you talk about the fractal, the first thing that comes to the mind is a Mandelbrot set. Uh, so the more you zoom inside the, the Mandelbrot set, the more similar patterns you are able to see. And that's the most fascinating part about fractals. And this is being represented on a complex plane uh, where x, y axis represents a real and the z axis represents the imaginary part. So we pick a point in the coordinate plane and add the, and pass it, iterate it and pass it through the equation z n plus one z n squared plus c. And we can also add some instructions of changing the colors and everything accordingly. And similarly, we can create Julia sets, which are pretty much similar to Mandelbrot set. And these are basically the boundary points that tends to infinity and then doesn't in, uh, tends to infinity. Okay, when you go deeper inside the Mandelbrot set, we see that the Mandelbrot set is extending outwards on the XY plane and creates a bifurcation diagram. And this logistic map is basically a part of the Mandelbrot set. And we, uh, this bifurcation diagram is created only on a real line because uh, we put only real numbers into the equation. And one fascinating thing about uh, this uh, bifurcation diagram is that this method was the first method to generate random numbers on computers and gives rise to a very famous topic called chaotic behavior or chaos theory. And which is basically deterministic chaos, something which is unpredictable. So very small change in the initial state can bring drastically different changes in the final outcome. And so we can change an initial change by some margin and we think the final outcome will be slightly different. Like you can see the four images, but what we actually got in the end is, is a deterministic chaos. And the best example to see chaos theory is attractors and which are basically mathematical functions that tends to evolve over time. And if you're using processing, you can just use points to create these um, attractors. And if you're not using processing, there's a very cool library called PyWiz, which has great examples of attractors and you can experiment with them like Swenson attractors, bedhead attractors and more. Okay, so this is like the second last topic. Uh, so we'll see how we can simulate the water paint effects uh, or the oil paint effects on the canvas. So uh, the second image shows how we can use the water paint effects uh, on a canvas on a 2D Cartesian plane. So to give you an overview, what I'm basically doing is like, I'm basically uh, creating a shape such as polygon and then starting extending its edges outwards uh, and doing by doing so recursively and passing it through a deformation technique. And eventually we'll be getting some fine details and fine vertexes on the outer layer, which eventually gives us this cool watercolor effect. And further, you can also create, use some blur effects or et cetera to add some more features. And so how to do it? So I'll quickly take two to three minutes to finish this thing. Uh, so first we divide the uh, polygon in, so first, Firstly, we create a polygon of say 20 sides and append those values to the polygon object. Then we initialized uh, a mid range of 50 and we try to divide those sides. So we call the function get mid and by passing the parameters as the polygon object and the <clears throat> mid variable. Uh, these variable, these uh, the values we passed are basically the mean and standard deviation in our function. So inside the get mid function, we as we pass the two um, values as mean and the standard deviation, we are looping over and we just taking the previous value and the current value of the polygon, and we are just passing them to the get center point function, which is returning a random number fitting the Gaussian distribution. And once we had that value, we can append those previous, append the previous value and the newly uh, generated midpoint value to the new vector object. And we can just directly return it. And now what I'm doing is like, I'm looping from zero to the length of the newly updated polygon. So initially we had some 20 sites of the polygon. Now we have thousands of sites. And once we have those points, we can simply uh, create the X, Y coordinates by passing that uh, value of uh, side X and side Y. Uh, with a random value between zero and 25. Right, just give me one minute, I'm done. Okay, so we just pass, uh, just we are sending the values back to the random Gauss values. And once we have those coordinates, we are just creating vertex at X and Y position. And this is a random Gaussian method for the scene. And eventually we'll get something uh, like this. 
And this is the last thing where, okay, this is uh, using shaders of our creating oil paint effects. And you can check the link for a better understanding or the better approach, uh, which is in a say by Tyler Hobbs. This is the last thing, which is like pixel sorting algorithms, which is, I'll just, I won't be going through the code. I'll just give you a quick overthrow. I'll just take one more minute. So what we do is in the pixel sorting is it's basically isolating the horizontal and vertical lines of pixel in an image. And um, we are sorting their positions based on a number of criteria. So basically we load the pixels, we then pick the original pixel with some XSL function. We then pick the next pixel position, change the number of uh, signs, and maybe you, change, you can also see a change in the direction of pixels. We just compare it and swap the pixels. So, and this is a very simple uh, implementation of it. And eventually if you just run the function with this values, you get something like this. And the, this is- Niras, and, I'm and sorry to so have to cut you short. And it was a very nice want, talk. If, thank you if very you much. Have some questions you can go back to the talk call back and just chat with me thank you so much yes thank you thank you very much and let me play okay. your applause so um, let me just do this like this thank you thank you